<laughs> Chapter 10. <clears throat> the good people who are publishing this book have a concern that they have expressed to me. The concern is that readers like yourself will read my history of the boiler orphans and attempt to imitate some, some of the things they do. So at this point in the story, in order to uh, mollify the publishers, the word mollify here means get them to stop tearing their hair out and worry. <sighs> Please allow me to give you a piece of advice, even though I don't know anything about you. The piece of advice is as follows. If you ever need to get to Cradle Cave in a hurry, do not, under any circumstances, steal a boat and attempt to sail across Lake Lacrimose during a hurricane because it is very dangerous and the chances of your survival are practically zero. You should especially not do this if, like the boiler orphans, you have only a vague idea of how to work a sailboat. Count Olaf's comrade, standing at the dock and waving a chubby fist in the air, grew smaller and smaller as the wind carried the sailboat away from Damocles' dock. As Hurricane Herman raged over them, Violet, Klaus, and Sonny examined the sailboat they had just stolen. It was fairly small, with wooden seats and bright orange life jackets for five people. On top of the mast, which is a word meaning the tall wooden post found in the middle of boats, was a grimy white sail controlled by a series of ropes, and on the floor was a pair of wooden oars in case there was no wind. In the back, there was a sort of wooden lever with a handle for moving it, this way and that, and under one of the seats was a shiny metal bucket for bailing out any water in case of a leak. There was also a long pole with a fishing net at the end of it, a small fishing rod with a sharp hook and a rusty sp spying glass, which is a sort of telescope used for navigating. The three siblings struggled into the life vest as the stormy waves of Lake Lacrimose took them farther and farther away from the shore. I read a book about working on a, a sailboat, Klaus shouted over the noise of the hurricane. We have to use the sail to catch the wind, then it, it will push us where we want to go. And this lever is called a tiller, Violet shouted. I remember it from studying some naval blueprints. The tiller controls the rudder, which is below the water, steering the ship. Sonny, stand it back and work the tiller. Klaus, hold the atlas so, so we can tell where we're going. And I'll try to work the sail. I think if I pull on this rope, I can control the sail. Klaus turned the damp pages of the atlas to page 104. That way, he called, pointing to the right. The sun is setting over there, so that must be west. Sunny scurried to the back of the sailboat and put her tiny hands on the tiller just as a wave hit the boat and sprayed her with foam. Car Tim, she called, which meant something along the lines of, I'm going to move the tiller this way in order to steer the boat according to Klaus's recommendation. The rain whipped around them, and the wind howled, and a small wave splashed over the side, but to the orphans' amazement, the sailboat moved in the exact direction they wanted it to go. If you had come across the three boilers at this moment, you would have thought their lives were filled with joy and happiness, because even though they were exhausted, damp, and in very great danger, they began to laugh in their triumph. They were so relieved that something had finally gone right that they laughed as if they were at the Sturgis instead of in the middle of the lake, in the middle of a hurricane, in the middle of trouble. As the storm wore itself out, splashing waves over the sailboat and flashing lightning over their heads, the boilers sailed the tiny boat across a vast and dark lake. Violet pulled ropes this way and that to catch the wind, which kept changing direction as wind tends to do. Klaus kept a close eye on the atlas and made sure they weren't heading off course to the wicked whirlpool or the rancorous rocks. And Sunny kept the boat level by turning the tiller whenever Violet signaled. And just when the evening turned to night and it was too dark to read the atlas, the boiler saw a blinking light of pale purple. The orphans had always thought lavender was a rather sickly color, but for the first time in their lives, they were glad to see it. It meant that the sailboat was approaching the... <sighs> Lavender Lighthouse, and soon they'd be at Curled Cave. The storm finally broke. The word broke here means ended, rather than shattered or lost all its money, and the clouds parted to reveal an almost full moon. The children shivered in their soaking clothes and stared out at the calming waves of the lake, watching the swirls of its inky depths. Lake Lacrimose is actually very pretty, Cloud said thoughtfully. I never noticed it before. Sin, Sunny agreed, adjusting the tiller slightly. I guess we never noticed it because of Aunt Josephine, Violet said. We got used to looking at the lake through her eyes. She picked up the spying glass and squinted into it, and she was just able to see the shore. I think I can see the lighthouse over there. There's a dark hole in the cliff right next to it. It must be the mouth of Curdle Cave. <coughs> Ch 
Sure enough, uh, and the sail boat uh, drew closer uh, uh, and closer. The children could just make out the lavender lighthouse at the mouth of the nearby cave, but when they looked into its depths, they could see no sign of Aunt Josephine or of anything else for that matter. <coughs> Rocks began to strain the bottom of the boat, which meant they were in very shallow water, and Violet jumped out to drag the sailboat into the craggy shore. Klaus and Sunny stepped out of the boat and took off their life jackets. Then they stood at the mouth of Cradle Cave and paused nervously. In front of the cave, there was a sign saying it, it was for sale, and the orphans could not imagine who had wanted to buy such a phantasmagorical. <coughs> uh, the word phantasmagorical here means all the creepy, scary words you can think of put together place. <sighs> the mouth of the cave had jagged blocks and all over, its, all over it like teeth in the mouth of a shark. Just beyond the entrance, the youngsters could see strange white rocks, rock formations, all melted and twisted together so they looked like moldy milk. <coughs> the floor of the cave was as pale and dusty as if it were made of chalk, but it was not besides that made the children pause. It was a sound coming out of the cave. It was a high-pitched, wavering wail, a hopeless and lost sound, as strange and as eerie as Curl Cave itself. <coughs> What is that sound? Violet asked nervously. Just the wind, probably, Klaus replied. I read somewhere that when wind passes through small spaces, like caves, it can make weird noises. There's nothing to be afraid of. The orphans did not move. The sound did not stop. I'm afraid of it anyway, Violet said. Me too, Klaus said. Jenny, Sunny said, and began to crawl into the mouth of the cave. She probably meant something along the lines of, We didn't steal a soul in sailboat across Lake Lacrimosa in the middle of Hurricane Herman, just to stand nervously at the mouth of a cave, and her siblings had to agree with her and follow her inside. <coughs> the, <coughs> the wailing was louder as, as it echoed off the walls and rock formations, <coughs> and the boilers could tell it wasn't the wind. It was Aunt Josephine sitting in a corner of the cave and sobbing with her head in her hands. She was crying so hard that she hadn't even noticed the Baudelaire's coming to the cave. Aunt Josephine, Klaus said hesitantly, we're here. Aunt Josephine looked up and the children could see that her face was wet from tears and chalky from the cave. You figured it out, she said, wiping her eyes and standing up. I knew you could figure it out, she said, and took each of the Baudelaire's in her arms. She looked at Violet, and then at Klaus, and then at Sunny, and the orphans looked at her and found themselves with tears in their own eyes, and they greeted their guardian. It was as if they had not quite believed that Aunt Josephine's death was fake until they had seen her alive with their own eyes. <coughs> I knew you were clever children, Aunt Josephine said. I knew you would read my message. Klaus really did it, Violet said. But Violet knew how to work the sailboat, Klaus said. Without Violet, we never would, would have arrived here. <coughs> <coughs> and Sunny stole the keys, Violet said, and worked the tiller. Well, I'm glad you all made it here, Aunt Josephine said. Let me just catch my breath and I'll help you bring in your things. <coughs> <clears throat> the children looked at one another. What things? Violet asked. Why, your luggage, of course, Aunt Josephine replied. And I hope you brought some food, because the supplies I brought are almost gone. We didn't bring any food, Klaus said. No food? Aunt Josephine said. How in the world are you going to live with me in this cave if you didn't bring any food? <clears throat> We didn't come here to live with you, Violet said. Aunt Josephine's hand flew to her head and she rearranged her butt nervously. Then why are you here? She said. Stim! Sunny shrieked, which meant, because we were worried about you. Stim is not a sentence, Sunny, Aunt Josephine said sternly. Perhaps one of your older siblings could explain in correct English why you're here. Because Captain Sham almost had us in his clutches, Violet cried. Everyone thought you were dead and you wrote in your will and testament that we should be placed in the care of Captain Sham. But he forced me to do that, Aunt Josephine whined. That night, when he called me on the phone, he told me he was he, he was really Count Olaf. He said I had to write out a will saying you children would be left in his care. He said if I didn't write what he said, he would drown me in the lake. I was so frightened that I agreed immediately. 
Why didn't you call the police? Violet asked. Why didn't you call Mr. Poe? Why didn't you call somebody who could have helped? You know why, Aunt Josephine said crossly. I'm afraid of using the phone. Why, I was just getting used to answering it. I'm nowhere near ready to use the number of buttons. But in any case, I didn't need to call anybody. I threw a footstool through the window and, and then sneaked out of the house. I left you the note so that you would know I wasn't really dead, but I hid my message so that Captain Sham wouldn't know I had escaped from him. Why didn't you take us with you? Why didn't you leave us all alone by ourselves? Why didn't you protect us from Captain Sham? Klaus asked. It is not um, grammatically correct, Aunt Josephine said, to say, leave us all alone by ourselves. You can say, leave us all alone or leave us by ourselves, but not both. Do you understand? The Baudelaire's looked at one another in sadness and anger. They understood. They understood that Aunt Josephine was more concerned with grammatical mistakes than with her saving the lives of the three children. They understood that she was so wrapped up in her own fears that she had not given a thought to what might have happened to them. They understood that Aunt Josephine had been a terrible guardian, leaving the children all by themselves in great danger. They understood... <coughs> and they wished more than ever that their parents, who never would have run away and left... The Malone had not been killed in that terrible fire which had begun all the misfortune in the Baudelaire lives. Well, enough grammar lessons for today, Aunt Josephine said. I'm happy to see you, and you are welcome to share this cave with me. <coughs> I don't think Captain Sham will ever find us here. We're not staying here, Viola said impatiently. We're selling you back to town, and we're taking you with us. No way, Jose, Aunt Josephine said, using an expression which means no way and has nothing to do with Jose, whoever he is. I'm too frightened of Captain Sham to face him. After all he's done to you, I would think they would be frightened of him too. We are frightened of him, Klaus said, but if we prove that he's really Count Olaf, he would go to jail. You are the proof. If you tell Mr. Poe what happened, then Count Olaf will be lost away and we will be safe. You can tell him if you want to. Aunt Josephine said, I'm staying here. He won't believe us unless you come with us and prove that you're alive, Violet said. No, 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 Aunt Josephine said. I'm too afraid. <coughs> Violet took a deep breath and faced her frightened guardian. We're all afraid, she said firmly. We were afraid when we met Captain Sham in the grocery store. We were afraid when, you, when we thought that you had jumped out of the window. We, we were afraid to give ourselves allergic reactions and we were afraid to steal a sailboat, and we were afraid to make our way across this lake in the middle of a hurricane. But that didn't stop us. <coughs> Aunt Josephine's eyes filled, filled up with tears. I can't help it uh, that you're braver than I, she said. I'm not sailing across that lake. I'm not making any phone calls. I'm going to stay here, right here for the rest of my life, and nothing you can say will change my mind. Klaus stepped forward and placed his trump card, a phrase which, which means said something very convincing, which he had saved for the end of the argument. Colonel Cave, he said, is for sale. So what? Aunt Josephine said. That means, Klaus said, that before long, certain people will come to look at it. And some of those people, he paused here dramatically, will be realtors. Aunt Josephine's mouth hung open, and the orphans watched her pale throat swallow in fear. Okay, she said finally, looking around the cave anxiously as if a realtor were already hiding in the shadows. I'll go.